Hey everybody, welcome back. Today I'm again working on the D24 and um, I've come to some new into some new information and I wanted to expand on that a little bit more and it has specifically to do with the overload function of the D24 but this would also apply to like the D32 or the D20 if you have either of those monitors it has the same PA board and the PA board we'll talk about later on in the video after I get through some uh, initial things that will uh, that's the board that we recapped in the previous video and talked a little bit about the overload light so I won't get into too much into what was happening because there's a lot of information in that video but I will explore a little bit deeper on the overload light and the functionality of it and why it was there and some other information that I've come into again but I wanted to start things off on why I'm even doing this to begin with and why I really go through and recap any of these uh, machines and kind of the thought pattern behind my philosophies that I follow with recapping these machines and then help, hopefully this will help answer some of those questions that I get af often asked about specific things like why certain caps go bad and certain caps aren't why do I have cap kits that only cover a certain smaller portion of the main board while the other 65 70 percent of the board is not going to be changed usually on capacitors so I want to go through and tell you a little bit about that today and we're also going to explain the reasons why we're even doing this first off the main thing this is is preventative maintenance if you're lucky now sometimes it can be repair because a part has failed but a lot of times my goal is to prevent any major failure by making sure that I'm doing regular maintenance and if you even just google electrolytic capacitor lifespan right away at the top I got this explanation uh, when the life expectancies exceed 15 years for the life of a specific product then the capacitors electrolytic capacitors should be limited to 15 years and that's mainly due to the sealing materials deteriorating over time and that's what keeps the fluid inside the capacitor and uh, most of the time you know there's going to be these ripple currents that go through the capacitor so over time they do break down so Google will tell you right at the top of the page here from the aluminum uh, electronic capacitors Illinois capacitor company will tell you that but I have another article here that I'm actually going to link to in the description of this video and I'm going to go through it real quickly I'm not going to read through everything on it but it's a great article it talks about electro it's from XP power and it talks about electrolytic capacitor lifespan and power supplies now the reason I bring this up is every single uh, CRT has a sort of power supply built into it so that uh, especially is in every single CRT so those are going to have capacitors electrolytic capacitors in them and I want to jump down here because there is a formula that's based on you know the tolerance and how a capacitor is built and then they give you a tolerance rating for the capacitor what that actually means and how that's going to affect things over time so this is really the best part of this article it says here uh, manufacturers provide calculations to determine lifetime and application these are based on uh, I'm sorry our Ar Arrhenius equation for temperature dependency and basically the uh, reaction rate doubles every 10 degrees Celsius rise in temperature put it another way the lifetime of a capacitor doubles for each 10 degrees Celsius reduction in temperature meaning that a capacitor rated at 5,000 hours at 105 degrees Celsius if you drop that down to 95 degrees Celsius it doubles the life and then if you drop it down to 85 degrees Celsius it doubles the life again to 20,000 hours and so that's why uh, we you know if you follow this curve you follow this curve and you can see why some of the capacitors that are not exposed to heat where they may be way down here in this 55 degrees Celsius range and their hour expectancy is almost uh, 150,000 160,000 hours of use so that kind of explains to you a little bit more on why I don't necessarily always change those extra capacitors that are away from heat sources that have not really been impacted by heat and that are most likely still going to have a huge amount of hours left on them because most likely they're somewhere in this curve 
on the on the good side, unless of course they you could tell how much dra- how much more drastic um, the drop off is here in the high heat areas. And most of the components you'll see that uh, we get are going to be requested to be rated around 85 degrees Celsius, and that's putting it right at about a 20 to 25,000 hour lifespan. So for example, the BVM I'm working on right now in the video earlier has 27,000 hours. So it would actually make sense 100% to get in there and change any kind of capacitor that's been in a high heated element because the monitor first off was made in 1999. So we're well over 20 years in age. So we've already gone past the 15 year mark but we've also gone well past the hours mark on there. And I, for this BVM, I'm going to go ahead and change all the capacitors in it just because, you know, that's part of the thing I want to do with them because they're very special and because I can. But when you talk about other CRTs and other monitors, this is where that philosophy comes into play that you don't always have to change every capacitor and you're could still have the same amount of you know, effectiveness or screen capabilities, could not change if those capacitors don't go bad. So that's a little bit more in explanation into the relationship directly between time, heat, and the capacitor's lifespan. So that's just some first information I really wanted to get through. Now we're gonna jump in to the PA board explanation a little bit deeper, and we're gonna talk I'm going to go go back to the Sony BVM manual PDF, which I have pulled up here. And this is section 6-2 directly on the PA board. This is page 91 of the 239-page service manual. And in this particular writing on this manual, we're going to see, it's going to tell you a little bit about this board and why it even exists. It's a high-voltage generator and regulator circuit. And... Down here is pretty much the important information. There's a lot of things in here that basically tells you how this whole thing works directly. Great information here. It also references what each individual uh, important part does and what happens when it's in use. So that's all really good information. But I wanted to get down here was the excessive anode voltage protection circuit. That's the first one. And then right under that, there's the excessive anode current protection circuit and these are two circuits that are built into this bvm and really any d-series bvm to protect it look it says we'll just read this first sentence the excessive anode voltage protection circuit is installed in this model for the purpose of protecting the crt the actual tube okay when the high voltage increases up to an abnormal voltage due to the failure of the feedback system of the high voltage regulator circuit. So you've got a high voltage regulator circuit and that's not always going to catch the spikes in time or it could fail. So there are some excessive, again, voltage protection and it's the same thing for the current. It's going to tell you pretty much the same thing, limiting the current voltage through the detection systems through the control systems. But the reason I directly bring this up is if you read down here in this parts, it's going to tell you about some parts that are directly related to it. So if you have troubles with your PA board or powering on, or like mine, where it was excessively kicking into overload when it was not on a very, I mean, it was on a bright screen, but not a bright to where it should have been kicking into an overload already. So uh, anyway, long story short, there's a bunch of uh, components you can test. And after reading this, I noticed right here in the middle, it says that the current for this circuit goes directly through C801 of the PA board. So that is a very vital capacitor on the PA board that's electrolytic, that's over 20 years old, that should be changed. And right there, if that one fails or falls out of spec, you're giving yourself an opportunity for more current to flow through there, and it will either damage this diode, D801, or if the damage goes to the diode, it could literally jump that high current into the neck of the CRT and destroy the heaters, cause a pop that is so violent that it would actually crack the neck of the CRT. And that literally happened numerous times in the field 
And, mo and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but I wanted you to understand that there are those two protections built in normally in the PA board. This is not including the little PA daughter board, which I'll talk about in a second too, because I'm gonna talk about a little bit more into the vest investigation of the D24 I've got. And so again, you've got the excessive anode voltage protection and it gives you all the direct parts, what they're doing. And then you could actually test those parts in your PA board if you have any issues to see if they're failing or just replace them. Because down here in the anode current protection, it's gonna list quite a few important resistors as well as diodes and ICs and what they do again and how they work. But this is, again, one of this is the whole system that is actually there. So we know that that overload system is there. And if we continue to you know, look into why it's listed. It's, it's on a different page, and I'm sorry I can't refer to which one it is in the manual, but it literally says that when the overload light comes on on your monitor, adjust down your contrast and brightness because the monitor is sensing that there's too much uh, voltage going through there. And if that voltage keeps going through there and then pops that diode and then does it again, it could go straight into your tube, short out the tube, short out the flyback transformer, and cause all kinds of permanent damage to the monitor that you'll have to replace some of the very impossible parts to find for the most part. So again, uh, we're gonna look now at some pictures that I have from the recap of the PA board on my monitor. And I'm, as I show you some of these pictures, I'm gonna show you, you know, that 801 capacitor. I'm also gonna show you the PA1 board, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that PA1 board. Uh, because that's not listed in this manual, and there's a specific reason why. It was an actually an end-of-life product that was not released till late in December, I think, uh, or November, uh, anyway, end of the year of 2006, and that was well after the D-Series was uh, retired as far as being new models being made, and they were into the A-Series, and they were about to be done with CRTs altogether and get into the other uh, flat panel displays that they were using after they retired the CRT technology altogether. This was an end-of-life product. Sony made this PA1 board uh, between 2006, and they stopped manufacturing it in 2013, and they no longer have any stock in there. Uh, but anyway, I got all that information directly from a service bulletin that was shared with me, and it had all that information. It showed the PA1 board. It talked about how uh, excessive voltage could get through that system, the system would fail, the diodes and or the resistors on either one of those protections systems that we just went over in the manual, they would fail, and then current would go through there, the overload wouldn't catch it and shut the monitor down, the voltage would creep all the way through the flyback and the tube and fry one or the other to making them dead or useless. Uh, so that is why that PA1 board was developed. It was a third fail-safe to help in case both those other things, it was supposed to be a better version of a tripping device to basically help with the overload problem. So without too much more talking, let me go ahead now and we'll jump into some of these pictures. And I'm gonna just go through these and show them to you and talk to you. So this is the PA board that I have, the top side of it with all the capacitors removed. Again, uh, pretty easy job as far as the top of this thing is concerned. Uh, there are those resistors, though. If you need to look at the resistors, they're going to be over here. And then the diodes are probably going to be surface mount diodes underneath here, you know, um, listed under here by the letter D. And then the capacitor, now this is with the capacitors off. You can see up here where we got our jumper installed. And this is exactly to the book on how Sony had and I can't show you that, again, I can't, sorry, I cannot show you that specific service bulletin because I promise I wouldn't. It's never been published. And therefore, I can't risk, you know, publishing it for the first time um, and getting him in trouble or anybody else in trouble because he might not be supposed to, whatever. Anyway, you just have to take my word for it that this bulletin is out there. It's not been released to the public, so that's the reason I won't release it. But I'll go through and tell you about the information with the photos the best as I can. So again, you install this uh, right here. You know, there's one of those diodes right there, but you install it, one of the legs of these, and uh, over on two other points, and then it's got some ground points. And again, it's a third circuit protection for the overload, so you don't continue to overload it too much. 
and uh, do any permanent damage to it. There's just some underline. This is the spot in the D24 where it went. And of course, you know, it fits in there fine and perfectly. And, um, and the door swings shut. Lots of good testing done. So this is about, uh, I've, I've had the thing tested for probably 10 hours is how many hours I've put on this new PA board, just running tests and like gameplay footage. So just to make sure that the new caps are good, uh, because the manual does say, you know, give it some time. But I want to zoom into this area because, again, this is where the capacitor is right in here. And uh, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in, too, a little bit more. And so bear with me here. But if we look kind of, let me pull myself out of the picture a little bit. If you look right here where my cursor is, there you'll notice the HV protection. And then up here is another uh, potentiometer HV adjustment. Those are for high voltage protection and the high voltage adjustments. I do not recommend messing with these, at least not for the time being, until I figure out more on it. Do not go sticking a potentiometer or you know a screwdriver in there and turning that potentiometer. It could cause fatal damage to your BVM because right over in this area also is that capacitor C801. We'll try to zoom in a little bit more on it. And um, you can see right here, maybe you can see the numbers on there, but that's the capacitor right there. Here, again, is a closer look up, different view of that capacitor right there. And so what I did was I took that capacitor, or I went back after I found that um, this capacitor was in there, and it was the only one. I went back, and I had a baggie here with all the capacitors from that cap kit, and I pulled out of the monitor. And so what I did was I took that out, and uh, I found that cap, and I thought I took my multimeter up to it and test it, and I've got some results here for you, but there's just a closer look at it. And 50 by 47, again, the only one was C801. I took some readings, which I've got here uh, listed. And this was the capacitor that I pulled. It kept reading at 52.0 or 52.1 or higher, okay? So it wasn't going down. It was actually reading higher than the 47 microfarads. Uh, out of spec by 10% at least, a little bit over 10%. However, I was reading the new capacitors, I was testing them, and they were tested out between 50.3 and 50.2, so I don't know whether my meter was testing a little bit high, but what I did want to say is, I mean, this is not much of a difference, but it still is a difference, and there's a possibility that when this old capacitor was under a load, that it could have even reacted differently and the voltage could have changed on it. And it could have just, again, like I said, reacted differently. So again, why do I talk about my you know, monitor more about this thing? Well, the reason being is <sighs> my monitor, as we talked about earlier, was made in 1999 originally, OK? So 1999 was the year that it was made. It was like number 22 off the assembly line. And so uh, my, our gut feeling is, is that, uh, you know, over time you can adjust, like you said, screen brightness and contrast uh, impact this greatly, this whole problem with the overload. They impact that directly. So uh, what we're thinking is that over time people would just turn up the brightness and the contrast on the monitor and cause those overloads to either occur more often or, you know, just putting that much voltage through the whole system after 25,000 hours-ish, that can make a lot of these components fail. The tube's worn out because it's had excessive voltage continuously running through it over a lifetime. And eventually those components fail and the tube pops at like 25,000 hours, which was a common thing that happened apparently if you talk to a lot of Sony techs, which I have some Sony techs that directly explain this situation happening. So... Um, again, this was like years later after the product had been made. So you're just sitting at uh, this monitor that I have most likely at about 25,000 hours. The tube pops. The components are probably bad on this PA board. So Sony sends out the, in 2006 to 2008 for this monitor, they get a new tube installed probably. They get the PA board, one board installed, as well as the components on the PA one board that were like the... Uh, you know, diodes most likely were replaced. And so they were either replaced or the whole board would have been replaced. But if not, they would have repaired the board and then put that little circuit board on the 
main board, and then you'd have that extra protection there, and then they go ahead and install a new tube, which was most likely done here, and I'm going to show you some pictures of this tube because it is just hideous and uh, does not look anything like what it probably should look like for an install. So this is inside the back of this tube, and you'll just notice all kinds of this epoxy everywhere, all over the place. And you see this masking tape and epoxy, that's actually holding down numerous convergence strips. Uh, the tube, the yoke, I fear, has not been pushed up far enough to the back of the tube. I am not really can tell because there's so much epoxy on it that I can't get it to turn. Uh, you can barely see the wedges. They're just completely covered in epoxy. I'll show you some other pictures. This is the tube on it, the tube model number. So I'm not sure if anybody knows if that would indicate anything as it being a different tube that was in the original run, but possibly. Uh, here again is a close-up of the yoke next to the back of the tube. And uh, this is just what you've got. Tons and tons of that nasty stuff taped on. And again, here's a convergence strip. Here's a convergence strip. Here's a convergence strip. Here's a wedge. And it's all under this old epoxy. Now, this is a magnet for purity that I had to add because, again, this convergence and stuff is just jacked up beyond belief. So I added that to help with some purity, which it did. And here's the other side, the opposite side. Again, more convergence strips, epoxy tape, just blah. And... Even on the yoke adjustment wheels, there's a yoke adjustment wheels on here for, or trim pots, to change and adjust the convergence on it. There's different convergence adjustments you can make, not just what's in the main menu. You actually have about a half a dozen convergence adjustments. Well, they put a big glob of epoxy up there for no reason. And then here's just all that they slapped all over the neck. So... Basically, if you're overloaded, then too much voltage will come in here and will burn a heater out. And it says, according to that manual and according to the service bulletin, that this it would be such a bad thing that the tube itself, the glass in the neck, would crack. So that would be probably pretty scary. But if you ever come across one of these with a neck crack, you know that that's what happened, most likely. So again, all these things, there's not even a capacitor in the seaboard, you'll notice, but that's a look at there. There's, again, a look up here at that epoxy, more epoxy, different angle. And, again, same stuff, different angle. Just a complete mess inside there. And um, so that's what we think happened. We think it. this had the worst thing happen. So it was 25,000 hours. They'd been using the brightness and contrast to keep up with the picture, to keep it, you know, viewable because it's burning down the tube life by you know it, it's this is normally a tube that burns at a lower brightness than other tubes and it's it's got the power in it to physically push the beam way beyond the capability of the uh, tube itself to withstand the pressure so again that's a whole lot more about this pa board and we've gone through just about everything on it uh i know it's it's again a lot of information and this PA board, again, is on the D32, it's on the D24, it's on the D20, and it's a very important part of this whole setup because, again, it's got a couple protection circuits, but if those protections fail, that's when you're going to lose your tube instantly, most likely, and the flyback transformer, that's possible also. But that's the main point I wanted to get across in today's video. And what I'm going to be doing, again, on the next ones is we're going to continue to work on the re recapping these boards, get them back together, and then start working on the adjustments and the fun stuff inside the menus of this elaborate monitor. This video, anyway, has gone way longer than I'd hoped it was going to be. Uh, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't bore anybody too much, and I hope maybe you learned something. Definitely check this out. Look into it a little bit more. If you own one of these monitors, it's really simple to get to this side on the monitor. Just four screws and pop this plate off on the left-hand side of the monitor when you're looking at the screen. And you could check and see right there without doing anything else. See if you've got this daughter board installed. If you do, it's probably a good chance that you have a newer tube installed. And then you could check out the back of your tube and make sure it looks like that. Because if it looked all nice and factory standard, it, I wouldn't have thought the tube would have been changed. I would have just thought it was on its, you know, like... So that's the good news. We'll get this fixed up and make sure it's back to normal. Please leave a like. I'll see you guys next time with some more retro content.